Are you done? Mm -hmm. If one were to believe children's cartoons, light housekeepers are grumpy old men clinging to a solitary lifestyle and contemptuous of visitors who disturb them. True, lighthouses are built in fairly inhospitable locations, dangerous straits or rocky crags near trade routes, and Cape Hatteras is no exception there. The Diamond Shoals stretch a dozen miles out to sea, and sandbars and other shoaling can appear without warning. However, just down the street was Buxton, a bustling little fishing community, and offshore the Labrador current flows south to meet the Gulf Stream flowing north, making the seas off the Cape a veritable shipping superhighway. In the mid-1800s, it was clear the original lighthouse was insufficient to alert passing ships, and so, in 1870, the current lighthouse was built. Back then, the light would be nothing without its keepers, so tonight, as we enjoy the climb and the view from the top, I hope you understand some of what the keepers here experienced. The keepers were not just responsible for the light itself, they had to do everything around the grounds, from maintaining the keepers' quarters and keeping it stocked with firewood, to mixing the paint and applying it to the outside of the lighthouse, suspended in bosun's chairs, little more than a playground swing suspended from the balcony overhead. Provisions were often scarce, in the 1900s, a keeper might receive $40 a year in dried staples like flour and sugar, so they'd often supplement their pay by raising livestock on the lighthouse grounds, by gardening or fishing. Lighthouse keepers were allowed to keep their families with them, which made Cape Hatteras somewhat more comfortable than other stations. There was a school here in Buxton and plenty of people nearby. Livestock on the grounds didn't just serve as sources of food, they could be fuel sources as well. When the lighthouse was built, most of the larger lights were fueled with lard oil, which was cheaper than whale oil and burned brighter than vegetable oil. By the end of the 1870s, however, we were converting to mineral oil, kerosene. Properties that made kerosene an excellent lamp oil made it far more dangerous than previous fuels and is stored improperly, vapors could build up in the tanks as the weather warmed, leading to a potentially explosive situation. While this lighthouse has weathered its fair share of hurricanes, structural damage could quickly condemn it. To store the kerosene a bit more safely, the brick oil house behind me was built. The three keepers stationed at Cape Hatteras would usually work in three shifts, sunset to midnight, midnight to dawn, the third resting for the night. To begin our shift, we'd filter out the fuel into a canister to carry it upstairs. Have to be careful, though. Consumption is logged. Too little fuel means the lamp is dirty and not as bright as it should be. Too much suggests waste, which comes right out of our pockets. Now, I'm not going to ask anyone to carry this with them, but here I have a five-gallon bucket filled with water to give you an idea of how much weight the keepers would carry with them. Five gallons of oil in a glass container is close to 50 pounds, because on a long dark night, the lamp could consume almost two full canisters. I think we can agree it would be better to take what you need with you than make a return trip for fuel. Now as we climb the lighthouse, please be careful. Keep your flashlights down at the stairs and watch your footing. We don't want anyone getting hurt on the climb. Yeah. Twelve stories up and you can hear how loud the wind has gotten. At the base we were protected not just by the trees on the grounds, but by an outer wall of dunes protecting the island. Once above that protection, however, the winds can get dangerously high, regularly reaching 35 miles an hour. Today we close the balcony to climbers if the wind gets that violent, and close the lighthouse if the weather gets too rough, lightning, thunder, or water spouts offshore. However, the weather that sends us rushing for cover down below would send the keepers running here, as that is precisely when the light is needed most. High winds and waves can quickly batter apart a vessel caught on the shoals. Even on quiet nights, there is much to do. 
The first shift would unshroud the lantern room. Daylight reflected backwards through the lenses could easily damage it and fuel the lantern. He would have to wind the clock mechanism that rotates the light in order to get our night pattern of 7.5 seconds of flash. The mechanism was constructed like a giant grandfather clock, the governor spinning at 8 RPM as the 150 pound weight was lowered down the lighthouse. Coming up, you no doubt noticed the metal rails descending the center. Those were the rails that guided the weight up and down. Just think, the keeper would carry 50 pounds of fuel up 12 stories, only to wind three times that much to the top as well. Thankfully, the mechanism only dropped at half the lighthouse on a given night. Small mercies. Today, the light is powered an electric hum above us instead of the clatter of clockwork gears. If the weather was poor, usually you could find the lighthouse keeper here in the watchroom, the last landing below the light itself. There would be a small desk here, logs detailing the fuel consumption, the times of lighting and extinguishing, and any shipwrecks or hazards the keeper might spot. Come morning, the keeper would clean and polish every lens of the lantern every day. A feather duster to remove the outside dust, a soft linen cloth to remove any soot that the fuel had left behind, and polish applied with a piece of buckskin. In better weather, however. The view from the balcony is beautiful. Looking south, you can see the Cape. And during the day, you can see the line of white breakers marking the Diamond Shoals. Look west and north, and you can see Frisco and Avon. Here, though, is a challenge. Can anyone spot the mainland? Even under perfect skies, the best binoculars in the world, you couldn't spot it, nor could our beam be seen. The light is visible 20 miles out, but the closest point of the continent is another 7 miles past that literally over the curve of the earth. Aside from Nantucket Island and Fire Island in New York, this is about as far out from the mainland as you could get and still be on the Atlantic coast of the United States. While we're up here, we have some time to enjoy the view before the next climber arrives, so I'll allow you to mill about. I'm available for questions. One question every group has is about the moving of the lighthouse. Back when the lighthouse was built in 1870, it was built on a site about a quarter of a mile from the seashore, but coastal erosion and storms soon threatened. This tower was abandoned in the 1930s as many temporary fixes were attempted to halt the advancing seas. The beacon returned in the 50s, but the lighthouse was still in danger. Years of studies say the only reasonable way to save the lighthouse was to move it. In the late 90s, it took a year of preparation and about a month of travel to move the lighthouse two-thirds of a mile to its current location, from that point there where the metal groin meets the dunes. So once again, on our current location, we're about a quarter of a mile from the shore. I hope you enjoyed the night climb of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, how different it is from climbing during the day. We climbed it mostly in silence, listening to the wind rush by and the echoes of the surf pounding the shore. I hope tonight you appreciate not just the isolation and the difficulties that these keepers faced over many generations but the commitment that these men and their families made to protect countless innocent lives. Their spirit burns brightly even tonight as the Cape Hatteras beacon lights up the night sky. So good night and smooth sailing.